half in the bag. The devil is my hairdo. Well, Mike, we're back at Mr. Plinkett's house. Aren't we supposed to be half in the bag? I don't see an alcoholic beverage anywhere. Aren't we supposed to be fixing Mr. Plinkett's VCR? I don't see a VCR anywhere. Where am I? What does they? What, uh, where did Mr. Plinkett go? I don't know. I bet he's on some sort of crazy adventure. Is the pandemic over? We finally reviewed a very much talked about movie, The Batman. I mean everything, everywhere, all at once. Michelle Yeoh stars as Evelyn, a lady who runs a laundromat and gets caught up in a dimension-jumping adventure to save herself and her family. It's a tale with a grand vision by the guys who made Swiss Army Men. As the film goes from the vastness of the universe all the way down to the simplest of human moments. Well, Mike, we're talking about everything everywhere, all at once. Is. Uh -huh. It's been out for months now and people are still talking about it. Yeah, right. It got a lot of buzz right out of the gate and uh, it was in movie theaters and I said, eh, uh, uh, and then it uh, came out on streaming. I was like, oh, yeah. And then I was like, yeah. It's kind of like that other movie with a long, clunky title, the... Uh, something about the massive, massive weight of like unbearable, the massive weight of unbearable, the, the unbearable weight of massive, massive talent. talent. That's it. The Nicolas Cage movie, which I, I watched the trailer for it and I was like, oh, that's a little, uh, feels like a 80s movie, like you know, a little concept like that. I just know Nick Cage plays himself. Yeah. Which to me is like, I don't know, you're leaning too hard into the meme, but I haven't seen the movie. It's probably good. It's got good reviews and it looks fun. Like it's, it's, so it feels like an 80s movie. It felt like an 80s movie trailer, like uh, Trading Places or one of those wacky, uh, wacky comedy duo kind of movies. Okay. So you know, there's your setup. He's a, so a movie star that goes to, uh, 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 goes to the party for some rich guy, and then it turns out he's a drug dealer. And then he, he did you watch the fucking trailer? No, I haven't oh, even seen God. the trailer. You don't even. I'm like, don't. If there's you, a movie I'm interested in, I won't even watch the trailer. I'm like, aren't you getting my like like '80s movie? No, like, kind that's of why. Feel? I'm like, you don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I have okay. no fucking clue. That makes sense then. All yes, I know so. is that Nicolas Cage plays himself. The The Mandalorian is in it. Uh, I forget that actor's name. What's his name? Uh, Pedro Pascal. Oh, Pedro Pascal. Yeah, he he plays a. A wealthy man, Nicolas Cage, is doing movies as an actor, and, he, and a guy named Pedro Pascal, his people call up Nick Cage's people, and they say, he wants you to come to his big birthday party, and he's going to pay you tons of money to do it. He has all this memorabilia from Nick Cage movies and blah, blah, blah. He's a huge fan, and, you know, and he's like has this, uh, this, this, this palatial estate in, in, in Mexico or you know, somewhere, and then overseas, I don't know where, where it was, Spain. It was somewhere exotic. Okay. And Nick Cage flies there, and it turns out he's a drug lord. And then the FBI agents, played by Tiffany Haddish and somebody else, um, say you got to help the government, the U.S. government, catch this guy. And then there's they become friends, and okay. he doesn't know if he wants this to. This is not him what I would have expected. Yeah. When I hear like Nick Cage plays himself, I assume it's going to be like a like being John Malkovich yeah, or something. No, no, no. It, lo it looked very like. Like boilerplate '80s uh, comedy movie. Okay. Which is, it was what was intriguing about it. But I didn't watch it, so I don't know why we're talking about it for so long. I think it's because these two movies came out around the same time, and they both had big clunky titles. Big clunky titles and high concepts. High concept, and everyone was uh, talking about them. Yeah. And saying, why don't you guys watch this? That and the Batman, uh, which I heard is supposed to be good. I think it was Variety, picked the top 10 best films of the year so far. Most of them were like unheard of art house films, but The Batman was number one. Oh. And the man said it was the best crime thriller ever made, compared it to Chinatown and all sorts of high praise. And I don't I, know if I believe you. I said, how long is it? Three hours? No thanks. <laughs> But I will watch 177 hours of Zach Baggins hunting ghosts. <laughs> but Batman, hard pass. I think that's why this movie is connected with people so much. Because it is not dark, it is not serious, uh, but it does have an, a, an emotional, you have an emotional connection to the characters. Yes. I, I liked the movie. I didn't love the movie. 
Um, but I can understand why people have been so crazy for it because it feels so unique and fresh compared to other things coming out right now. It's a very, very good movie that overstays its welcome a little, a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's that guest that leaves a little bit too late from your party. Which but is- Who's a really nice guest and really entertaining and, and, and fun. Yeah, which is sort of the point. I mean, it's right there in the title. Everything ever, it, like it sounds overbearing and the movie is intentionally overbearing. And I don't know, maybe if I saw it when I was like 20, it'd be my favorite movie, but. That thought's a little too meta. I don't think they intended that. I, I like Swiss Army Man more than this. And I think that's not common. I think people, people seem to really love this movie. And like I said, I get it. Um, but for me, yeah, it, it gets a little exhaustive after a while. It, it just needs, just needs a little like, a little re, re, it just needs a little secondary editing session. A couple of fresh eyes on it and go, you can lose about 14 minutes. <laughs> and, and, you know, as you and I know from editing lots of things, a whole feel of a scene can be changed just by moving something or removing a couple lines even. A good example of that, a recent example, and this would be something that people should study in like film school, like editing classes, is Sylvester Stallone recently re-edited Rocky IV and you compare it to the theatrical cut and there's just little changes here and there where a shot kind of lingers a little bit longer or, well, there's big changes too. Like he cuts out the robot. Everyone makes fun of that movie because- There's a robot in Paul, it? There's a, a Polly, his friend Polly falls in love with a robot. It's, not... it's super 80s and stupid. Okay. So for this new mm -hmm. edit, he's like, cause the original Rocky movies are more serious. So he cut shit like that out. But the, the more interesting thing are the smaller changes. Mm -hmm. And it is, yeah, you just hold on someone reacting to something just a little bit longer, it can, it can change the entire feel of a scene. Yeah, I mean, this is a little more uh, grander scale than that. It's more about structuring the ending out yeah. better. Because um, cause I was into it. Because I remember you said, you, you should watch this movie. Um, and then you're like, I'm like, well, what'd you think? You know, and you're like, well, it's, it's good. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and then I'm watching it and like, you know, 75% of the way through, I'm like, what does Jay not like about this? And then we kind of get there, but I wrote uh, real quick. I wrote a couple things down. Maybe we can talk about this because you said it's highly original. I agree with you, but it is kind of drawing from many sources. I wrote The Matrix meets a Stephen Chow movie, mm -hmm. meets a Marvel movie, then toss in a little Rick and Morty and Back to the Future and tell Charlie Kaufman to write it. <laughs> Does that sound okay? Uh, yeah. yeah. There's a lot fair. of different, a uh, lot of different uh, things you could uh, obviously say. Well, what about this? What about this? Yeah. But but that's just kind of like like the first vibe because I saw Russo brothers on it. Oh uh, yeah, the producers. As producers, and I'm like, oh, and then and then it was like, what? What? And it's then, a multiverse thing. There's a multiverse. Yeah, yeah. Of course. You say, what about Spider-Man in the multiverse? <laughs> <laughs> I, I realize that exists. And the Doctor Spider Strange. The Spider-Man movie isn't about the multiverse. That's just an excuse to get the other Spider-Men in the movie. It's like a plot gimmick. This movie is actually about uh, the expanding universe and all the, the, the uh, options and ways your life can go. Um, what about Doctor Strange in the multiverse of madness? You did some review of that? You didn't even mention it. Uh, I remember it. <laughs> I, I, I made that connection. Mm -hmm. I, I, in fact, the connection was so big and obvious, I didn't even include it. You see what I did there? Where it's like it's not even worth bringing up. But sure, multiverse, yeah. yeah. yeah, but yeah that, right. that was the comment I kept seeing about, the, like, if you want to see a good multiverse movie, right, right, right. you should watch this little movie that nobody else is talking about, that I know about, called Everything Everywhere All at Once. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, everybody's talking about that movie. Right. I mean, yeah, there's there, in uh, Doctor Strange, there's the America Girl, who's the one who can travel between the multiverses and that's very similar to the joy character who also can do that and unless she's not a villain blah 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 you know michelle yo is the one she's well that's the matrix influence when they're big matrix the when they introduce the whole concept they're on the elevator and uh uh short round he's back baby short round is back uh but yeah he explains the whole situation when you get off this elevator if you turn left you go one direction in life if you turn it's it's very matrixy yes and then of course the matrix is influenced by other things so it's a whole whole endless layer cake of influences um i love that she's the one because she made every bad decision in her whole <laughs> life 
there's there's a lot of like really good dry humor in this. Yeah. Like when she's talking to her husband, played by Kikwan, aka Short Round, uh, aka Kid from the Goonies, Data. Data. Um, Who's, who has, doesn't have a big extensive uh, acting he, he career. He left acting for a long time. I think one of his last things before he came back was he had a small part in Encino Man. He was fellow student to Sean Astin <laughs> right, right, in Encino right. Man. Yeah. So it was kind of a mini Goonies reunion, but yeah. yeah. What a what a movie to come back to. Like he could have, you know, you, I'm gonna return to acting. You just get some generic part in a generic movie, but. But she's talking to him and, and she's just like matter of factly saying, I imagine my life without you and it was wonderful. <laughs> Yeah. It was beautiful. Well, even starting out when she first sees uh, going along with like disappointment in life, when she's, she is on the elevator and she sees when she's first born. Yeah. And the doctor says to her dad, he's like, I'm sorry, it's a girl. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so the premise of the movie is uh, there, there's the Alphaverse, the very, very beginning, uh, and then they, they're the ones that discovered that every action you take uh, in life, no matter how small, creates a separate universe. It's the string theory, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the worst Star Trek The Next Generation episode ever. Uh, with Worf, and which deals with this exact same concept, oh. because uh, I didn't include that. We have such contempt for our audience. <laughs> I didn't include that in my description. Can we just make a point, just a general point? Anyways, what was I saying? Oh, yes, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation played around with string theory before. Parallels, you said? Parallel, yeah, Wor Worf goes to a Batleft con conference. Sorry, competition. Mm. I imagine a Batleft conference would be kind of boring for Klingons. <laughs> <laughs> We've introduced the new Model 3XZ. It's got sharper blades. And they're all, oh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, I know what this thing is. That sounds familiar. I recognize this. It's a curved sword yeah. with all the handles on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So instead of going to a Batleft conference about the new Batleft models that are being released, uh, Worf goes to a Batleft competition. I was triumphant. I won champion standing. And somewhere along the way on his little trip in a shuttlecraft, he encounters some kind of special anomaly that gives him magical powers to create different, not create, but um, to uh, jump into the different universes that he's creating by making simple choices. Okay. For any event, there is an infinite number of possible outcomes. Our choices determine which outcomes will follow. And, um, and there's a billion of them, just like this movie, where it's like uh, some universes, uh, you know. And somehow I have been shifting from one reality to another. That is correct. How did this happen? I don't know, and it's not necessarily his choices, it's just different universes that exist. And so one, he's married to Troy in one, there's minor changes, just little different pictures are on the walls, but then there's huge ones where in one universe, the whole, the Borg has completely wiped out the Federation and, and all these, 20,000 enterprises start appearing at the end and they have to close this spatial thing that caused all the universes to collide at the end. <laughs> um, but it, uh, it establishes in Star Trek canon that there are multiverses. There are 10 hundred billion warfs. But there is a theory in quantum physics that all possibilities that can happen do happen in alternate quantum realities and 10 billion, million, trillion Captain Picards, which means the good news is that Star Trek Picard only existed in potentially one of these universes. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, so I'm happy about that. What's the J.J. Abrams movies introduce that too, right? Isn't that a different so timeline more kind like, of thing? It was more like a two timelines. This, oh, this okay. is just like, oh, one timeline Worf wears his hair down. <laughs> you know, it was very minor. Lots does, of very... does Worf like physically travel to these different? His consciousness. Okay. Like, like one second he'll be like, whoa, and then like he'll be look, what? I'm wearing different clothes, and, and then you know. Because that's one of the neat things in this movie. The concepts I liked, as, as opposed to like yeah. the America Chavez character in the right. Doctor Strange movie, where she's physically jumping. I like that it's more they you just you you uh, embody the your version of that self from that multiverse. Yes, yes. And in Matrixy style, you can, that, that was the neatest part to me was like, 
the choice to like, and it becomes like uh, sillier and sillier. The, the choice to stop and eat a, eat a stick of chapstick yeah. sends you off on a different path. Yeah. <laughs> There's some sort of specific thing you have to do, and it's always yes. something weird. And, yeah. and it will lead to some different path in your life. Like, what was it? She tripped as a child, and it knocked her eyesight out. Mm -hmm. That was the coolest part when they were trapped in the in the guy's like sex vault <laughs> and um they start trying to gas him and um she she's like uh oh well i need to learn how to th i think they, they pick it on the list like fight blindly mm -hmm. and hold your breath so she had to be able to have a past uh or alternate life where she was a like a swimmer or a singer yeah a singer where she had lung capacity and she could fight blind so she didn't get burned her eyes burned by the smoke so her one one pass she falls and gouges her eyes out and then she's the singer, and so she's out there doing her kung fu, yeah. <laughs> and um, and that was that was great. That was Matrixy, you know. I know kung fu. Well, and the, yeah, the idea that there's people like monitoring. Yes. You have to do this to yeah. jump to this timeline. Like, right. It's it's it's, it's Matrixy, but a lot more absurd and goofy. Yeah, the, the the look, obviously, the look of it, the production design of the, they're in a van, and the, the it's all kind of like retro looking tech and yeah. they've got goofy glowing headsets on and but yeah so she plays a lady named Evelyn who lives and works in their own Chinese coin laundry uh, uh, business and her life's hectic and it's kind of miserable and it's her original path where she she left China with her boyfriend when they were young and he sold her on a bad idea of, <laughs> of moving to America and buying a coin-operated laundry facility. Strained relationship with their father who doesn't approve of any of this. Yes, who eventually has to move back in with them because the wife dies and he's old and they need to take care of him. And uh, so every choice she made and is terrible and they're being audited by the IRS. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's another Matrix parallel is first learning about you know, the other universe that's, that exists inside a, like, corporate a, a environment. A drab office building. Yeah, most yeah. of the movie takes place in the IRS building. That's what I was surprised a by. fun juxtaposition. Because I, I knew it was, uh, like, a multiverse thing. And I knew that some of it's kind of absurd. But the fact that, yeah, most of the movie, the central story, right. anyway, yeah, takes place in that office building. Because locations don't really matter. Yeah. It's, it's just coming in and out. But they pick a dry, dull... It doesn't take place in something f fantastical. It's just... That's that's the great Jamie Lee Curtis looks so schlubby. Mm -hmm. Contrast. Well, that's what Contrast you need. You gotta good. you gotta ground it in something. So you start with that. You have your underdog characters. Everything's so schlubby and gross, and then yeah. you build on top of that into these yeah. sometimes beautiful, completely absurd uh, scenarios and visuals. Yeah, goes a little too far into the LOL so random humor uh, occasionally. Hot, Hot dog, dog fingers. fingers. Yeah. Maybe that would have been fine if they didn't like pinpoint it but they're like they travel to a universe where everyone has hot dogs for fingers like they specifically say it if you just cut to these weird finger things like i don't know that probably would have worked better the fact that they put such a fine point on it yeah well they're not really hot dogs no but just like just just show yeah, it don't, mean, don't even comment on it i, I guess yeah <laughs> yeah i guess the, 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 that's the character's interpretation of it they cut back to like 10,000 bc with like the neanderthals <laughs> And they, they, they kill what would have evolved into humans, the ones with the hot dog fingers kill them. I mean, it's like... The, 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 the visual is, is absurd enough. Yeah. Where I don't think you need to pinpoint it, but what they do... They help the audience along, because there's a lot of people out there that are, like, probably going to say, what's going on? You know, so they go back and they show, like, this is how everyone ended up with hot dog fingers, because... <laughs> You know, it's like Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon Man, yeah. where it's like one one died out and the other took over, mm -hmm. and that couldn't. And, and so one branch of humans went this way, and and uh, in that universe, mm -hmm. they they do a good job. It's it's so absurd, and you don't like. It's it's not hard to follow for as complex as it is. I, I think that's why it's gone over with people so well, because it, it is you know it's high concept and there's a lot going on, but it's never like yeah doesn't get bogged down or confusing. It, it contains, like, that's another thing, too, I was reminded of is, for some reason, Terminator. Because Sarah Connor is the, sh the schlubby waitress. And then in, in uh, we were talking about Terminator and how, like, well-structured it is. And you have Reese, and he's he's explaining to her all, all the, um, all the um, exposition while they're driving in the car chase. During and an action you scene. You get yeah. it all out there. And, and that sort of happens in this, where they keep having the action scenes and... Um, 
a short round. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, he, hey, there's worse things he could be remembered for. Right. Uh, he is explaining to her all, all the details of it. And they do a genius little thing where he's popping his glasses on and off. The, 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 uh, 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 what's, what's his, what's his real name? Uh, but, <laughs> but Kikwan has the glasses. And yeah. Kikwan from the uh, Alphaverse, who's guiding her, does not need glasses to, to see, so he keeps putting them away. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. I mean, the movie is very, very well constructed um, in, in kind of helping you along uh, uh, discover all these things with her and, mm -hmm. and teach you in, in a non, like, um, in a cinematic way, in a visual way. Yeah. Um, which it could have not done that and done it poorly, but it, it executes it perfectly. And having such a, a, a strong character at the center of it. Like yes. Michelle Yeoh's great. I love when they're they're in the, uh, the closet early on and he's explaining everything to her, how big this is. She's the center of this whole thing. And she's just like, I, I got stuff I've got to do. <laughs> it's like she just can't even wrap her head around She it thinks he's gone like off the deep end. <laughs> she, yeah, it was, yeah, it's just like some random ass person who is in uh, the fate, uh, fate of the universe is yeah. in their hands. And It's, and it's classic stuff of, of uh, yeah, focusing on that right. in, a, in an overall structure. Like you mentioned, the Nicolas Cage movie having kind of an 80s feel. Yeah. As far as the way this is all set up and delivered, that's similar to just a normal person that gets caught in this extraordinary situation. Kind of like Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah. Which yeah. also has uh, uh, James, James Hong. James Hong. 93, I think he is AKA now. AKA Gong Gong. That man has a career. And, and it's amazing. I was reading up on him, and he, he, he has like an engineering degree. Hmm. Um, was born in Minnesota. He has an engineering degree. Degree. He went to Los Angeles and was like working. He's like an engineer, and he's like, I kind of want to act. And they started like like little tiny roles as in like his early to mid twenties, and then just billions he's of got roles. So many credits. And it's like and he's even, directed stuff too. Yeah, he and, directed and some wrote. like weird softcore yeah. movie that I don't think I've ever seen. But he directed a movie called The Vineyard. Not very good, but. He's done it all. Yeah, but even to this day, it's like just random small roles. Mm -hmm. e even big roles, small roles, lots of voice work. He's in, uh, Rich and I were talking about Roger Rabbit, and we mentioned Chinatown. He's in Chinatown. Yeah, yeah, I saw that on there too. He's, he's in lots of stuff, but uh, here he is. Well, that's, that's another strong point for the movie, is just the general cast. Like, everybody's so great in this. Yeah, yeah. Like I mentioned, uh, short round, Ki Kwan. Ki Kwan. I'm gonna try and not call him short round, damn it. It's hard. You call him Dr. Jones, dog. Okay, Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones. But uh, like I said, like him coming back to acting for this is great, and then James Hong, and I don't know the the daughter. I'm not familiar with, but she's great in this too. Yeah. Based on where the story goes, she gets a lot to do in this movie. Yeah, Some no, she's fantastic good Fantastic outfits. <laughs> <laughs> The yin and the yang sort of situation there with what you do with the ability to see everything everywhere all at once. Mm -hmm. Kind of like uh, good side, light side, the dark side from Star Wars. That's, that's the thing, Jay, is ultimately the film is about family. It's true. It's true. The late, great Carrie Fisher. It's about family, and that's what's so powerful about it. This is a film about family, and, that, and it actually is what Star Wars the sequel trilogy isn't. <laughs> this is a trilogy about making buttloads of cash. I think that's just a point you go to because it sounds relatable. It's a story uh, yeah. about family, sure. I, I can just imagine the outtakes from that like interview. What the fuck do I say? <laughs> Carrie Fisher's like smoking. What do I say about this? I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> what the fuck? Say it's, I don't know, say it's about family, the Skywalker shit. Something's happening with Skywalkers and Rey and I don't know. We don't even know what's going on. We're just a team making the behind the scenes for the Blu-ray. You're told what to tell everybody just, you to just say. Just say like it's a story about family. Ultimately, it's about family. I don't Just say some bullshit like that. <laughs> okay. And then she puts on her acting gear. Really? It's about family. Cut. Was that good enough? Did that sound convincing? Yes, Miss Fisher. Fuck this. I'm taking my dog and I'm leaving. I'm picking up my dog and I'm getting out of here. Do you got all you need? What happened to her dog after she passed away? Was, Does her daughter it was, have it? It was bequeathed to uh, Billy Lord. Okay. 
As long as that dog's doing okay. Yeah, Carrie Fisher's dog would not be sent to the pound, Jay. She's fucking Carrie Fisher. I just want to make sure that the dog's alright. The all dog's right. fine. I'm okay. sure the dog's fine. Good. Everything. Everywhere. All at once. Woo! Oh, first take. I don't even know what I was saying. We're talking about this movie, right? Yes. Well, we're talking about family. We're talking about Star Wars. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now. Yeah, so grand, as I said in my intro, grand, the grand scale down to simple human moments uh, with the, the mother and the daughter. I don't know how much we should spoil here. No. Let's, uh, because that's the, really the guts of the movie. The, the multiverse and the, the stuff with it is just sort of like the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, that's why, you know, the movie, people r respond to it because yes, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's adventurous, it's creative. Um, it's, it's very well put together. Um, but over all that time, you start to like Michelle Yeoh and the family mm -hmm. and the whole little structure there. And you, get, you just get so much meat from all, all that kind of emotional stuff. And yes, they, they, they wallow in their own creativity at the end a little too long and we'll talk about that but that's that's what you get out of it yeah and and i don't want to spoil all those arcs because there are everyone's got an arc everyone's got a nice arc that sort of concludes well at the end but i don't want to spoil all that because that's what you get from it we could talk about hot dog fingers all day long <laughs> but i'm not going to spoil character arcs uh well to speaking of the hot dog fingers similar to swiss army man what i think these guys do well these directors is, is taking something that's initially absurd but then building emotion into it yeah. where it becomes kind of beautiful. Like in the hot dog universe, it's Michelle Yeoh is in a relationship with Jamie Lee Curtis. And even though visually it's absurd when they're like embracing with these stupid fingers by that point in the story, yeah. you're like, oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Or the, the, the bizarre Ratatouille homage, which by the way, I looked up the voice of that. It's a raccoon. What is it? Rac raccoon? Raccoon. Raccoon. <laughs> And apparently it's voiced by uh, Randy Newman, the music guy. Huh. It's like, why don't you just get Pat Oswalt to do it? <laughs> Pat Oswalt will do anything. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Pat Oswalt is too busy having a little cameo in The Boys. Is he in the new season? Yeah. He was in season two. Or season, yeah, he was in the last season as the talking, like, gills of the... Yes, his voice, right. Yeah. Um, and he was also a voice of a cartoon character in Star Trek Picard. But no, he has a visual cameo. Uh, they make fun of the, um, the John Lennon Imagine uh, pandemic thing. Oh, I thing. heard about that. Yeah, the Gal Gadot thing. Imagine all the people. So they're mocking that in true sarcastically <laughs> sharp-witted boys fashion. But um, yeah, so the boys season two can officially be called a best of the worst reunion oh, season. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Oh, I've been waiting an hour to get that out. Anyways. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, wh what are we talking about? Uh, Rakakui. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I see it. That, that, that's just wild because they make fun of her because she misremembered Ratatouille or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And then, then that created its own. And somehow she started writing the screenplay and then submitted it and it became a movie. It <laughs> was reality. I don't even know how that worked, but, but it was funny because it was sort of like a misremember. Yeah. And then it's this whole situation where the rat's pulling out his hair and he's hiding under the, the chef's hat. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's super awesome at like cutting up food at like the Benihana. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> Uh -huh. And the fact that they weren't too worried about making the raccoon look like real. Like it's no, just, yeah. It's just kind of clunky it wasn't animatronic. A it wasn't thing. like a CGI <laughs> uh, raccoon. It was almost like it was out of a bad movie. Yeah. That we used the animatronic raccoon. But even that, that ends up having kind of an emotional arc to it. Yes, like, yes, yes. Uh, and, and that's where it's... I mean, when you start to get to the end, they set up little tiny storylines in all these different universes. And then they sort of like break them down, make them the worst that they could be, and then they make them better. And, and, and that goes along with the two characters. The daughter, who I'm sure is not coincidentally named Joy, uh, is at odds with her mother in real life. And in the multiverse, they're also 
at odds because she knows everything and then Michelle Yeoh ends up knowing everything. They become like superpowers because uh, they can, in, instead of your brain going crazy and de you dying from it, you, you can see everything. You got the special power. And uh, that's may, mainly, it's, uh, it's ultimately, it's a film about choices. You thought I was gonna say family, but it's also a film about choices. Mm -hmm. um, so really like the bedrock of the movie is she chose to leave China with her boyfriend. The father chose to let her go you're no daughter of mine, get out of here. Go ahead and ruin your fucking life. And then, and so, and then ultimately maybe kind of accepting certain choices and learning to love. Uh, I love that montage at the end of all the happy times because mm -hmm. you never got to see any of that. Yeah. All you see is like the stress of her life and <laughs> there were happy times and then the husband admits some things and then daughter admits some things. And so, yeah, and then there's a lot, there's a lot, um, it's more, it's what, what really it's about. It's a story about family. It's about family. And that's what's so powerful about it. And choices. And, th and this, uh, I, I say that un, un, un ironically, unjokingly. Sure. Um, because it actually is. It's just hard to say that anymore. It's hard to say that. It seriously. We take it seriously. <laughs> thanks, Gary Fisher. <laughs> Or thanks, intern who fed her that line. Thanks, thanks, uh, Disney publicity department. Disney Blu-ray behind-the-scenes <laughs> producer, <laughs> right out of college, producing Blu-ray behind-the-scenes for the Last Jedi. Carrie Fisher I told her to say it's all about family or whatever, and then she said, "Well, how about I leave off the or whatever part?" <laughs> because that wouldn't sound very good. <laughs> and I said, you're right, Miss Fisher. <laughs> Just say, it's, 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 ultimately, it's about family. That sounds so good, I think. It's about family, and that's what's so powerful about it. What does Ryan Johnson say? I don't know. He's masturbating on a porg. <laughs> so awkward. Well, we, we sung the praises of this movie. It's very inventive, very creative, very well done. Uh, all the, the cast is great. Uh, uh, the, the way that they unpack it all, it's a lot to unpack and they unpack it well. Um, it is two hours and 20 minutes and it, 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 in my opinion, it could have been a tight two hours um, because- Maybe it, even less. Maybe I, I think for this level of energy, like the movie's going for such a visual absurdity and it's just very, it's fast paced, which is great early on, but to me that does get exhausting after a little bit. Right. And that's when it, you say it overstays its welcome. Yeah, it, uh, it. It's not like it gets bad. It's just, it's just overwhelming in a way that kind of makes it unsatisfying. Right, yeah, there's a weird like aftertaste to yeah. it that, that's just like, so well. Like it should be wrapping up. Right, because there, there are those like epic, like swelling, emotional, like this is your Oscar clip. Yeah. And they nailed Bye. that. Joy you see. See, it's only a matter of time before everything balances itself. Uh, come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm sorry, Rekka Cody. I'm sorry. That hurt cold. That, that sort of like Oscar movie feel where it's like, here comes the music, here comes the cutting back and forth, the paralleling, and you know how, you know how they do it. You know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Sure. And you know what they're doing. And you're like, oh. This is, this is the end. And then nah, something else going. happens. And then, well, now we got to do this. I really thought the ending was at the IRS when she's going up the stairs, you know, mm. and sort of like uh, doing something to all the people that are attacking her that, that sort of like is counter to what her daughter's doing yeah. without giving away too much. And then it's like, oh, this is nice. This is a nice ending. That's how she's going to win. Mm. And then it's like, well, now we got to go back to the office party. And then now we got to deal with Jamie Lee Curtis coming back. And then now we got to deal with the daughter in the parking lot. Yeah. And then and then it just kind of like, oh my gosh. None of it's bad on its own. None of it's bad on its own, but. It's, um, it's more of a, I guess, a structural issue. Maybe it is but. meta because they, they could have chosen four paths to end the movie <laughs> on and they chose all four.
They could have been like uh, like the movie Clue when that was released in theaters, a different endings. There you, you know go. what ending you're going to get. There you go. Or or find a way to condense the I, I think it just, yeah, just everything needs to be... Either trim it down. Consolidated. Without, this is not spoilerish, but <clears throat> there is a mo there are moments where each of the universes kind of go completely sour. And then, uh, and that's sort of like the villain, the daughter. And she's like, the, ah, fuck every, nothing matters. Um, it's, just, it's, it's a hope, hopefulness and, and con contemplativeness versus nihilism. Yeah. The, the, it's like the two spectrums, ends of the spectrum. And she's like, ah, everything sucks. Nothing matters. Ultimately, the donut, the black hole donut. Well, it's not a donut. Bagel. It's a bagel. Sorry, it's bagel. an everything bagel. Everything meaning literally everything. Yes. That's and one of those things, that, again, where it's like, eh, a little too, a little too LOL so random, but. Sure. Yeah, yeah, a little too cartoonish. Yeah. A little too Rick and Morty-ish. Yeah, maybe. There's a, the, the uh, Rick and Morty has the, they watch interdimensional cable. Mm -hmm. Baby legs, you're a good detective, but not good enough because of your baby legs. Well, there's cable networks from different dimensions and similar similar in, in tone where it's like, okay, they might work in an animated thing, Yeah, this bagel, but it took me out a little. Now let's look at all the stuff we got. We got a bag of bobbish, that's eight grapples. We got a plumbus, that's six and a half grapples. Yes. Get me out of here now. Yes. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yes, it, that, that's, uh, you did a great job. You did a great job, now stop. <laughs> My only complaint is too, too, uh, the, the, too much. Yeah. Too, too much uh, goodness there. So I guess it's not the worst problem to have. It makes me less likely to want to revisit it, want to like rewatch the movie. Yeah. Because of that, where it's like, oh, that's, it's a good movie, but uh Right. Then it keeps going. I don't know if I want to get back into that again. Right. So, I don't know. Boom, 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 three acts. You got to tighten it up. You gotta, you gotta have your third act be perfect mm -hmm. and, um, and conclude everything nicely and don't just keep indulging. I think, yeah, that's the key word I think is indulgent. Can be a, a debilitating thing with some movies. It doesn't go that far, but it is like, all right, you got too much of a good thing here. Yeah. So, uh, you know, de deserving of the praise, but maybe you and I might eye it a little differently. But uh, I'm sure there are. Hey, other... I'm just glad a movie like this has caught on, though. That's true. Uh, and and continued to be like I mentioned off camera, like it was randomly trending on Twitter yesterday. It's been out for months, but it just people keep bringing it up and keep talking about it um, because I think it is such a breath of fresh air for a lot of people. It's not another, you know, like Doctor Strange. Nobody's talking about that movie. That was people stopped talking about that movie the week after it came out. Like, ah, oh, we're done with this. Thor: Love and Thunder. Thor 4, more Thor, <laughs> starring Natalie Portman as Thor. How, why is Natalie Portman Thor? I don't know. But that type of stuff is like, yeah, that's, that's exhausting. Done with that. So it's a movie like this that uh, there's a lot going on, but at its core, it's very simple and very relatable, and the characters are good. Performances are good. There's a lot to latch on to. So Jay, would you recommend this movie to your 103-year-old grandmother? <laughs> or do you think she might not understand what's going on? I, I think that might be a little too much for a, for one of the olds, but uh, for everyone else, yeah. It's like a solid movie. Most people. Most, Most people. people. It's just a shame that it goes on too long, but that might just be a personal thing. I don't know. Right, right, right. Someone may just, just be super into it and just loving every minute. Um, and I, I love 90% of it. Uh, it will get an Oscar nomination, no doubt. Which would also be nice, because it's a comedy that doesn't get recognized all that much at the Academy Awards, so. Uh, but I'd, I'd recommend it, yeah, but I'd say, it might feel a little long, but you're really gonna like it, because it's very different. And it's, it's a very well done. Um, and uh, remember Short Round? He was in Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. So, Jay, when do you think Mr. Plinkett will return from whatever adventure he or she is on? I don't know. 
Uh, should we continue to fix his VCR so he could watch his night court tape? <laughs> we got to get that night court tape fixed before the new night court starts. When does that happen? I don't know. That's going to like... Everybody's just been dying for the night court reboot. He's going to remember about his night court tape when the new night court comes out on streaming. Oh, we better get to work then. We better get to work. He hasn't asked about his night court tape in over five years. <laughs> But we should fix it so we can watch it. Okay. But the...